All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome again to virtual seminars for pre-game brain geology. Today we're hearing from Dr. Paul Link, who recently retired from Idaho State University. On his, his talk is titled Proterozoic Strata and Tectonics of Northwest Laurentia. Next week we have Ross Anderson from Oxford University. His talk is titled Darwin's Dilemma: The Importance of Fossilization to Our Reading of an Animal Antiquity. So we've got a good lineup for the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I just sent everybody the, the little note with the link to our code of conduct and, uh, and a couple of thoughts. So um, we'll go ahead and let Andre introduce our speaker today. OK, it's a great pleasure to introduce Paul Link from Idaho State U University. Uh, so yesterday searching like to introduce Paul, I realized that he was one of the uh, free crows, uh, uh, trolls, uh, which uh, like we all now work on broad impact statement. And uh, I thought uh, it's amazing that uh, uh, John Crow got a grant in I guess late seventies, and uh, had three students, including Nick Crystal, Christy Bleak, uh, uh, sitting uh, in audience, and uh, uh, Paul and Julia Miller, and they all kind of changed um, or worked on glacial deposits in Western uh, U.S. and uh, uh, defined sort of perspective on glacial uh, near Proterozoic glacial deposits. So uh, Paul did his uh, undergraduate at Yale and through Brian Skinner uh, went to University of Delaide, uh, I guess that's where to do on a degree. And that's where he got exposed to neoproterosic glacial deposits. And when he followed to University of California, Santa Barbara, where he did his PhD uh, right in Pocatello area. And so after it, uh, he was hired by Idaho State University and spent whole career there. And um, uh, Paul worked a lot uh, even beyond near Proterozoic glacial deposits, basically on all uh, Proterozoic sedimentary record of uh, Western US. So, the, and uh, that leads to his talk, which basically a review of his work and. Uh, uh, Proterozoic strata and tectonics of Northwest Laurentia. So with this, I pass to Paul. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, so, uh, so, um, so I was at I was at uh, at ISU in Pocatello for for over forty years, and and I started out in the glacial game exactly as Andre uh, introduced. In fact, um, I just can't get this to go now. What is my problem? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So yes, so uh, uh, I think I had on the order of 35 uh, graduate students who worked in Proterozoic or Archean rocks um, and uh, including the, uh, the Pocatello formation, and then the uh, strata, the Brigham group strata above that, uh, and, uh, and then the Uinta Mountain group below that. Uh, and so I wanna kind of, I wanna talk about all of these issues first, and then at the end, I'm going to go back to the Pocatello and back, back to, uh, uh, snowball issues because that that still seems to be a, a a hot topic and especially the geochronology uh, which is uh, um, has been uh, in the in the papers lately. So so as as Andre said, uh, 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 John Kroll uh, was my advisor as as well as Nick and Julia, and uh, here is John uh, in in Australia in 1986. And, and he very much, uh, and all of us, I think we approach things in a uniformitarian way. And uh, we, we, instead of um, uh, explaining things by 
unusual uh, single time events, um, uh, I think as, as Paul Hoffman has done, uh, we, we were much more on the, well, this, this facies could have formed in this way and, and this was put together. So, um, so that, um, that is, was the, the basis by which we, we worked. And, uh, and as Andre said, at, at one point, we were uh, the, uh, the helpers on a field trip that John was leading. And we, uh, he, uh, he referred to us as Kroll's trolls. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, people who would help. Okay, so, um, so my uh, PhD uh, was on the Pocatello formation. And then I slid right down the hill into the university uh, at uh, at Pocatello, Idaho State University, and um, and so in those early uh, times, um, uh, Nick uh, was was uh, investigating sequence stratigraphy and and had uh, a PhD student, Marge Levy, and so we we formed a, a fair amount of ideas, sort of in in the early eighties, um, and. Uh, and then Paul Hoffman and Snowball Earth uh, issues uh, came along and, and the game has somewhat changed. And I've been pretty much out of, out of the Snowball uh, game uh, for 10 years. So Paul came down, Paul Hoffman came down to Pocatello, he's 11 years ago, and, um, or 10 years ago, 1911, uh, two, he came down 10 years ago, 2011. And, um, and I have not had a lot of, uh, um, new stuff since then. So this putting this talk together was very instructive for me because I dug back um, into what we were thinking and then read the more recent stuff. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about, I'm a stratigrapher, so I'm going to talk from old to young uh, from the, in Idaho, the Pioneer Core Complex, the Belt Supergroup, uh, some exciting uh, new rocks, uh, new dates of rock that we found that are above the belt. Uh, and then uh, my graduate student who is now uh, working at Curtin University with uh, ZX Lee, uh, uh, Dan Brennan, uh, has worked on the Deer Trail Group uh, in Northeast Washington and the Buffalo Hump Formation. Uh, and then also um, um, I and, and students and Carol Daler worked on the Uinta Mountain Group and on the misspelled Windermere succession. And finally, I'm gonna go back to the Sturdine and the Maranoa. Okay, and so here's, uh, here's a map. And uh, uh, we, we always have to have maps, but Pocatello is down here. And so this is the Southeast Idaho thrust belt. And then if you go down South uh, into Utah, actually, I'm going to go like this and turn my pointer into a fuzzball. Okay, so um, the Pocatello Formation continues down south into Utah uh, and, and has been correlated all the way uh, to Death Valley. And then it crops up again uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Edwardsburg in central Idaho, and then up in, um, in Northeast Washington and in the Huckleberry Formation and, and other of the base of the Widermere Supergroup. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the Pioneer Core Complex. Uh, we're gonna talk about strata here in central Idaho that were incorrectly mapped um, as Ordovician. And uh, we've demonstrated that they are uh, Neoproterozoic. And in fact, they're correlative with the the uh, Neoproterozoic section in Southeast Idaho. Um, and then also uh, so, uh, the same section of rocks has been found uh, at Edwardsburg and Stibnite uh, in North Central Idaho. And so the, the Neoproterozoic stratigraphy continues uh, all the way uh, from the Southeast Idaho to the Canadian border. Um, of course, uh, in central Idaho, these brown rocks on this map are the, are the belt supergroup, the Lemhi group. And, uh, and of course the main belt supergroup is exposed over here in, in Montana. And of course this is, is mesoproterozoic, but this is something which 
we will also um, talk a little bit about. Okay, so, so we'll start in the pioneers and the pioneers are, uh, are one of the core complexes of the Cordillera and they're located here. Uh, north of the Snake River Plain, and uh, the the uh, our work in the Pioneers uh, tied them PMCC Pioneer Core Complex tied them to the Grouse Creek block south of the Snake River Plain, and so the Archean uh, protoliths extend from the Albion Range up into the Pioneers. And then they are uh, truncated by this zone, which is the Great Falls Tectonic Zone. And the Great, <coughs> Great Falls Tectonic Zone was active uh, from 1800, uh, maybe to 1700 million years. Uh, and, and then separates this Archean block from the Medicine Hat block, which is the next one to the north. Um, okay. And um, so our work in the, in the uh, core complex uh, revealed Archean dates, which was not too surprising, except that, that they had not been demonstrated before. The rock was thought to be uh, Paleoproterozoic, but uh, 2,600 uh, million, same similar ages to the uh, Albion Range, uh, south of the Snake River Plain. And so that makes sense. And then the other uh, more exciting to my world um, discovery in the pioneers was a, a neoproterozoic uh, orthonice, which is about 695 MA. And of course, 695, then that overlaps with the snowball earth uh, time. And so this became a, a, a more interesting than than, uh, than we, we, we would have uh, originally thought. And I'll come back to the, um, one of the paranices in the, in the pioneers uh, in a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna work from north to south. Um, and so we're gonna go up into the Clearwater block in, in um, extreme Northern Idaho and look at this uh, Laclede Nice. This is work of Dan Brennan. Uh, and uh, Dan has, has uh, looked at uh, the zircons uh, with, the, with the shrimp and with the ICP and um, has um, um, determined as we knew that the ages uh, were 1570, were in what's called the North American magmatic gap, but the, uh, as Dan has found the, the hafnium isotopes in the um, Clearwater block, Laclede Nice are, are more negative, more continental uh, than the Gawler Craton, which is the probable source of these zircons uh, from South Australia. And uh, so the ages are identical to the uh, Gawler range volcanics uh, in, in South Australia. Um, and then as we um, sort of talk about the, what I'm gonna talk about today, so, so long ago, but when I was a graduate student, uh, Grant Young and his students uh, uh, defined uh, succession A, succession B, succession three, C in the uh, Canadian Cordillera. And, and so we are going to, um, to go through in order uh, of these rocks and then, and then come back to the Pocatello formation and, um, and some of the, the newer ages that have been found there. But um, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Lemhi group, uh, the Plutons that intruded them at 1380 million, uh, this new uh, Leeton Gulch Tuff, 1336 MA, which is a, a new age uh, that uh, is post belt at least as we think of the belt uh, today. And, uh, and then also the Deer, Deer Trail Group, which is a Northeastern Washington uh, assemblage, which is also post belt. And then we're gonna come up into succession B, talk a little bit about uh, 
the Buffalo Hump Formation, which uh, uh, is also exposed in Northeast Washington and, and is of this 1770 MA uh, uh, timeframe, part of the uh, Pahrump Chuar Chump uh, uh, supergroup of Carol Daler. And then we'll talk about the Pocatello Formation. And finally, and then I'll, I'll jump up to the Wilbert. We found some new sills, 601 MA, uh, dated by uh, Bedeliite. Uh, by Kevin Chamberlain, and that's an exciting, um, they were pre previously thought to be Jurassic, which made no sense. Uh, 601 million makes more sense. And then we'll finish up talking about some of the Pocatello stuff. Okay, so here's North America, and this is Jamie Jones' uh, reconstruction. Jamie and his colleagues have been working on Mesoproterozoic rocks, the Jan Yankee Joe formation, and and correlative rocks in New Mexico, and they are they are overlapping in age <coughs> with the Belt Purcell Basin here in Idaho and Montana, and uh, overlapping in age with the um, rocks of the PR1 Basin, which uh, which uh, 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 have, has been investigated. Uh, Medic et al. Um, Dirk Thorkelson's student uh, uh, worked in there. And, uh, and there's a very firm contact between the, the PR1 basin and um, a source area in, in Australia. So, so yeah, Queensland was uh, proximal to North America um, at 1470 MA. And then of course the uh, Gawler Range volcanics were proximal to the belt at uh, 1460, 1450 MA. Um, then of course the issue is, all right, well, here we are uh, at uh, 1480 um, and, uh, and then here we are at, uh, at 1440 and here is, uh, uh, the South Australian craton, the North Australian craton, Antarctica, the moss and continent. So where did they go? Where did they go? Uh, and, and this is an old problem. Uh, where's the passive margin? Where's the passive margin uh, for the belt supergroup? Well, there isn't one. And so uh, I've uh, been advocating uh, that, that the source areas uh, uh, were strike slipped away uh, from Western North America um, in about post belt time, if you will, uh, 1350 MA. And then of course this led to, there are some Granville age, there are some uh, 1200, 1100 MA uh, garnets in North Idaho that are, must have been formed during a Granville uh, age uh, orogenic belt, but not a passive margin. Uh, at, that led that terminated the, the belt supergroup. Um, if we go to the belt, uh, and I've worked extensively here with Don Winston, and uh, and and uh, so this is, I suppose, the convention wisdom. I think Don's right. Um, it's shallow water. It was a big lake. It mostly was not connected to the world ocean. It doesn't have sequence boundaries in the sense that Phanerozoic basins do. The contacts are cyclic and gradational, and it's way thick. And the lower part has got some sills in it, um, and probably that's part of the load that that's that held the basin down. And then the upper part is is a sandstone, and um, and the youngest ages that we're getting in the belt are around 1390, 1380. And then there's an intrusive, a granite intrusive that intrudes uh, at 1370 that, that, um, or 1380, that would be the end of the belt. Okay, so here's Don Winston and some llamas and Nate Hathaway uh, in the Lime High Range. Uh, this would be whew, 20 years ago. Uh, and um, and one of the things we worked on were the, was the Lemhi group, the southern piece of the belt supergroup. So here's the main belt supergroup, 
this is the Peace, Peace River complex that I talked about the Laclede Nice. Uh, but and we tour, we worked on the Lemhi group, and the Lemhi group um, is we ran many thousands. I don't know if they in those days. Yeah, they probably were thousands, thousands of Detroit zircons, and there was this very uniform composition of um, of zircons that were about. 1720 to 1730 MA, uh, no obvious source. So we have invented the big white arc and the big white arc, big white refers to a, a uh, stratigraphic unit in central Idaho. Anyway, the big white arc uh, uh, must have been in this Southern area, presently in the Yavapai province and, and provided zircons to the Lemhi group from South to North uh, at 1430 to 1400 MA. And uh, so this is something that, that needs to be part of any, any paleoproterozoic uh, reconstruction. Uh, and of course, then this um, uh, uh, Trevor Dumitru has recognized the presence of the Lemhi doublet, which is the 1380 Plutons and then the 1750 Zircons that, um, that uh, are found in Cretaceous rocks in California, but represent the the uplift and the re removal of belt supergroup. Okay, and here's our work on the belt. Um, so Pritchard formation at the bottom has got this uh, uh, non-North American uh, age, uh, uh, 1570. And then, then it is overlain uh, by uh, Lemhi group rocks and, and the classic belt uh, at the top of the succession is Missoula group. And these have these 1730, 1730 peak. And, uh, and there are a few sin belt zircons, 1450-ish, uh, but um, uh, the big bulk of the, of the sediment, it, at least in Idaho, uh, came from the south. Now, the Missoula group in Montana is a little bit more diverse uh, in age uh, of the detrital zircons that go back. To 1780, and so the source terrain may have was 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 more diverse and was different for the Missoula group than for the Idaho rocks. Okay, and uh, so here is one of Don Winston's uh, classic cross sections, shallow water facies sitting across the belt. Um, some of uh, you folks uh, may have uh, come across Brian Pratt Brian Pratt's papers in the. A GSA bulletin uh, about the uh, belt at, at Glacier Park, where he talks about instead of it being a shallow water deposit, he talks about earthquakes and he talks about uh, 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 sedimentary structures produced by downslope sliding. And, um, and then this is a summary diagram and the craton is to the east, the origin is to the west. There's no origin. There is no origin at belt age to the west. So, so again, I, I don't know what Brian was thinking about, except that, uh, that he, Brian likes to be controversial. So anyway, so, so I would not put a lot of stake in, in that reconstruction. Okay, then the other thing uh, which is interesting is that in the Pioneer Mountains, so these are, these are, are zircons from the Pioneer Mountains, um, and there is a Paranize unit, uh, which has pretty much the same zircon population as the Missoula group, or excuse me, same zircon population as the Pritchard formation, and probably a little, probably a different one, uh, maybe overlapping with the with the Missoula group. But anyway, I think I think there is a. Um, there's meta belt. There's meta belt in the Pioneer Mountains core complex Paradise. And uh, I think beyond our work that says, hey, this might be belt, no one has done anything on that rock. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk uh, uh, a little bit about some of the work that Dan Brennan uh, has done. Dan was a master's student with us. And then he went to Curtin University and uh, his output of uh, manuscripts in the last two years has been nothing short of extraordinary. Um, 
so his name will be everywhere. And I hope he gets a good job, one of you folks out there. Uh, anyway, so we are going to go um, talk about the Northeastern Washington section right now. In Northeastern Washington, as Steve Box and others uh, have pointed out, there is Map Bell Supergroup. And in that Map Bell Supergroup, here are zircons that are of the North American magnetic gap. And so the old interpretation was, well, that's fine. Uh, it comes from the West. The problem is that those zircons persist into the snow slip, which is belt, and maybe into some of the deer trail group rocks. And so where did the source area rift away to if it still persisted up into the, into the upper uh, belt supergroup? And uh, uh, so that is an issue. Uh, I think it, it relates to the timing of the strike slip that moved um, Australia out of, the, out of the area. But anyway, uh, those zircons are found uh, through the entire belt supergroup, Missoula group, Pritchard, Pritchard, entire belt supergroup in Northeast Washington. Then the Deer Trail group, which was originally correlated with the belt, uh, has now uh, been shown to have um, a few post-belt zircons uh, and, and to be a different package. Um, some of the younger zircons are in the 1350 range. And this might be the passive margin for that mysterious passive margin succession, rift succession, or um, because it was correlated with the belt in the old days, maybe it's it's uh, just another uh, intracratonic succession. And then here's the buffalo hump formation, and Dan has found in the buffalo hump um, a few 1780 zircons, which are the same age as the um, youngest zircons in the horse thief springs formation and in the uh, Uintamon group. And so, so this is succession B. The buffalo hump is part of the chump. Seaway. And then here are the Windermere succession. Okay, and now we're back down south. Here's central Idaho. And uh, so this is the Salmon River Mountains. And uh, here are two localities. I'm going to talk about Bay Horse and Leeton Gulch. Uh, and Bay Horse, this is the block that was thought to be Ordovician that we now know is. Uh, Neoproterozoic, and Leeton Gulch is the locality where this uh, 1336 uh, tuff is found. So here's the 1336 tuff. Uh, this is above the belt, uh, and um, and these are ages from the Arizona um, Laser Cron Lab, but uh, it's a porcelainite. It's a brecciated porcelainite. It's it's green. It's it's uh, you can't see the grain size. It's not a sandstone. It's not a siltstone. And, um, and so this is sample of 23JM19, uh, uh, which, and which uh, has produced this age. And so these are new rocks. This is, this is not, this is nothing that, that has been expected. And so we have a student, John Lever, who's working on these rocks. And uh, stay tuned on that one. Uh, Fine-grained, uh, parallel bedded, <coughs> uh, not cross bedded. Uh, so, thirteen thirty-six tough, and uh, and then these are are detrital zircon uh, results uh, from a whole succession of rocks at Leeton Gulch. So here's uh, seventeen hundred. This is the belt peak, right, and then. Here is the Leeton Gulch Peak, 1336. And uh, then as it turns out, in some of the upper overlying Wilbert formation and then in the overlying um, Tyler Peak formation, uh, there is a 760 peak, which is the uh, Sturdian Age volcanic peak. And then there is a 500 MA Zircon Peak, which is from the uh, beaverhead plutons, which are anomalous 500 million year old plutons that extend across central Idaho. 
Okay. <laughs> and while I'm here, uh, this is also the place where 20 years ago, uh, Jen Carr and I, uh, uh, at, at the, uh, uh, we were shown the place by Rob Hargraves. Here's the unconformity between a breccia and a bedded sandstone. If we look in clasts in that breccia, some of the clasts have planar deformation features that cut across quartz grains. And so this makes you go, hmm. And uh, the hypothesis is that the exposed rocks, which are over here uh, by chalice, are correlative with the shatter cone bearing rocks of the Beaverhead impact, which are uh, over in, uh, in uh, the Beaverhead Mountains along the border between Idaho and Montana. Okay. Now the Uinta Mountain Group as, uh, as uh, worked on uh, by uh, uh, Carol Daler and then several students making several uh, USGS EDMAP uh, has two distinct provenance signatures. Uh, one is a local Archean only provenance coming probably off the Wyoming Craton, right over the Utah, Utah Mountain Boundary Fault. And then the other is a recycled Grenville province. This is part of Rob Rainbird's uh, Grenville Mackenzie Mountain sequence succession uh, B um, uh, Grenville fan, I guess we could say. And so somehow these, these Grenville grains got transported west into the Uinta Mountain Group Basin when it was forming at about 770 MA, pre, pre sturdium Tonian. And uh, an idea that, uh, that, that we had was that, that maybe there was some sort of a funnel along the grain of the uh, Cheyenne Belt down into the Uinta Mountains. Here's uh, Utah, Wyoming, the Cheyenne Belt. Okay, now to go back up north. So we're up uh, in uh, Northeast Washington, uh, looking at this Buffalo Hump Formation. It's got a, 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 not a lot of grains, 758, but the Buffalo Hump, the Uinta Mountain Group, and then some of the uh, 2R Group have these same 770, 780 zircons, and so that is probably the uh, age of these rocks, and they are not mesoproterozoic, and they're not uh, they're not sturdy, and they're tonian. Okay, so um, I've talked about this stuff. Uh, talked about the Priest River area. Uh, talked about the pioneers. So now I think we're going to go down and look at the Pocatello Formation and friends. No, and I'm wrong. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about about the zircons uh, in in the uh, in the Bay Horse area, which uh, explain which have the same patterns. I think uh, at Bay Horse and at, in the succession uh, in the top of the Neoproterozoic, the south of the Snake River Plain, we have one group that is um, Paleoproterozoic provenance only. And then we have another group, which is Grenville and Paleoproterozoic. And so it's this Grenville age succession, uh, which, which comes and goes. It's a distal, it's a distal regional uh, zircon flood, but it's not present in all the strata. And so the, um, the, what we think is the transcontinental, transcontinental arch was, was rising and, and blocking off the supply of these zircons. Um, within the uh, Ramshorn slate, uh, which is uh, at these, in these Bay Horse rocks, uh, formerly thought to be Ordovician, there's some gabbro, and the gabbro, Kevin Chamberlain dated it with a Badleyite uh, 601, plus or minus 27, not a great age, but still, that's better than nothing. And so that fits pretty well with uh, the recent uh, uh, Provow at age, uh, et al. age on the um, Browns Hole in northern Utah. And so there was volcanism at, at 601 
um, during the time, you know, of, of the passive margin deposition. So that's something to go hmm about. And then here is that diagram from Dan Brennan. It shows the neoproterozoic transport across a rising continent, transcontinental arch and a Cambrian transport as the transcontinental arch extended to the south. Whether this is true or not, it's an interesting idea and it, it explains our data. Okay, and then finally, uh, uh, was there one rift or two? Did the continent rift at 750, which is kind of a, a, a commonly uh, bandied about idea, which I don't think is correct. Um, but we, uh, so the, the, the uh, hypothesis and the, the data uh, we have uh, fits a long, rifted period with final breakup at 540, and that's when the thickest deposition of, of uh, sediment was. And uh, so this doesn't fit real well with some of the um, other uh, rifting of North America concepts. Okay, now I wanna talk about the sturdy and about the snowball. Um, so this is from Paul Hoffman's paper, uh, a long sturdy glaciation, a short Marino glaciation, and uh, as the time has gone on, we uh, we recognized that the sturdy glaciation was up here, 680, or the 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 Pocatello formation was up here, 680, 660. Different than the Rapitan glaciation. The Rapitan ages are 710, 720. <clears throat> and so that caused a fair amount of problem. And because the idea was, um, no, wait a minute, you got 60 million years for a glaciation. And um, you know, the Rapitan's good, and we got an LIP that could trigger it. But you know that's a long time for, for a glacial period. And I think that, that is, that's still a fundamental problem. If we go back to Max Crittenden, who was USGS in Northern Utah back when Nick and I started, um, he talked about uh, two episodes of glaciation, each with multiple advances or treats, non-glacial interval, interval of a few hundred thousand to a few million years duration. Well, that's kind of what this looks like. Um, uh, it's also what you could say if all of these uh, glaciations were sturdy in an age, but um, I think Max was very much uh, uh, in favor of, of this kind of uh, hypothesis for the Utah-Idaho uh, glacial rocks. So anyway, so uh, this is the Pocatello area. Here's the, the freeway, I-15, I it's easy to get to. Um, and uh, and and uh, so actually Tony Prave and Carol Daler and I, uh, I think were the first to find a green, uh, fine grain porcelainous rock. I'll show you in a second. And then Mark Fanning uh, came up there and collected it. And, uh, and we got a, a, an age six, 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 seven. And then of course uh, this caused uh, everybody's uh, hackles to rise. And so Sam Browen came out in uh, 07, I believe, and collected some more of this uh, tough. And, um, and so what I wanna do now is I wanna run through the stratigraphy of the Pocatello Formation, show you some pictures of rocks, and then we'll talk about that number. Okay, so from bottom to top, lower diamictite, uh, mainly volcanic clasts, couple granite clasts, uh, this is an epiclastic tuff, uh, and this this is the rock from which Josh uh, uh, Keeley got uh, 685 uh, ages. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, is interbedded with uh, these uh, this lower diamictite, uh, and then here is the upper diamictite, beautiful rounded. Uh, imbricated stones in this place, striated stones, drop stones. So these meet all the criteria that Roberta Rudnick uh, gave for us last week for a glacial rock. Um, also a clast 
of a volcanic rock. And this volcanic rock class is identical to the outcrop so the, uh, of, the, of the Bannock Volcanics. So the Bannock Volcanics were probably being eroded uh, by the glaciers and, and uh, then the class uh, deposited in the upper diamictite in the, in the Pocatello formation. Uh, graded beds, um, volcanic classic graded beds, Cabo conglomerate, very coarse grain, boulder conglomerate. Uh, and, you know, all those are, 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 are sedimentary facies, which by the uniformitarian approach, we interpreted as glacial, some glacial marine, some non-glacial, uh, but uh, um, heterogeneous. Meltwater was present. Okay. So then we get to the upper Pocatello formation and we get to the upper diamictite and the question of whether it is Sturgeon or Maranoan. And uh, I guess I would just uh, say first that Ron Coates from the South Australian uh, Geological Survey uh, came over to the US with Max Crittenden in the early 70s. And he uh, looked, Max uh, dragged him up the hill and, uh, and he looked at this pink laminated dolomite, not very thick, a couple of meters. And Ron said, that looks like the Nuckalina dolomite, which is the Maranoan cap in South Australia. And uh, so the next picture, I hope. Yeah. Let me out, I wanna go down. Uh, well, how do I go to the next slide? That's a question. No. Sometimes there's something in the bottom corner, a couple of arrows Excellent. in the bottom left, maybe. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to go here. All right, there. That's my next slide. All right. So here's the dolomite. Here's the dolomite breccia. And uh, so you actually get a better view of the dolomite breccia, uh, uh, of the dolomite within the breccia than, than you do uh, uh, from the outcrop. And, and Paul Hoffman has been here and he says, well, that's a, that's a Maranoan post snowball storm deposit is how uh, he interpreted that. Um, here is uh, Wolfgang Price of the South Australian Geological Survey. Um, and he is looking at the golden spike the base of the Ediacaran, the, the Nuckalina dolomite in Flinders Ranges National Park. And the paleo mag uh, folks have been here and drilled through this thing and, and it's in a national park and there's a golden spike. It's a big, uh, if you ever go to the Flinders Ranges, you have to go to this locality. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, Mark Fanning who went to Adelaide Uni, uh, uh, and they had a second year field camp at uh, Pitchy Ritchie Pass, north of Adelaide. And uh, they, apparently the folks in the field camp uh, had the little rhyme, it's always greener on the Nuckalina. And uh, that's because the Nuckalina uh, maybe retains water a little bit better. You're in a desert, there's more grass there. So I think that's kind of funny. Anyway, so this is, this looks like the, this looks like the pink dolomite. And uh, Okay, so anyway, Mark Fanning and I, uh, we, we sampled and we dated this rock. And this rock is above the pink dolomite. So it's above the upper diamictite. It's above the pink dolomite. It is a green porcelainous metatuff. And um, it, it, uh, um, Here's some cross beds. And so this, this guy, and this upside down, these rocks are upside down. And so um, I think you would agree that, that uh, this rock is a very different grain size than that one. It was deposited on, an, on, on cross beds, not in deep water. And so here's the, here's the Concordia age, uh, six, six, seven, plus or minus a five MA. Um, and, um, and we said, well, now that sure looks like a 
like a primary tough that doesn't look like a uh you know a reworked uh, mixed uh, deposit and the detrital zircons or the the zircons in that tuff uh, confirm that so here's just what they look like these are not rounded grains these are not rounded grains that have been traveled and and beaten around by by uh, uh by by flowing water there are beautiful archean age euhedral grains and then there are neoproterozoic, angular uh, uh, grains. And so Fanning interpreted these as all produced during an eruption with uh, the eruption coming through the 25 MA basement and uh, then depositing this, uh, this uh, tophaceous rock um, at about this time at 667 MA, maybe, you know, it could have been reworked by the first rainfall, the first rainfall, but certainly not something that sat around on the surface of the earth for 30 or 25 million years, and then was deposited after the Maranoan glaciation. So our interpretation was this was a sturdy and tough and this dated the sturdy and glaciation. So, um, so as I said, I've, I've had um, a lot of uh, very fruitful uh, emails over the last couple of weeks with, with Mark Fanning and with Nick Christie Blick and with Carol Daler. And Carol uh, has shared with me this, uh, this uh, in prep manuscript at Geosphere, Isaacson et al. And, uh, their interpretation is that even though all the zircons from the Pocatello formation and from uh, the cap carbonate, above the cap carbonate, are 660 MA or more, the rock is actually Marinoid. And um, so that is, that is something that I, I, don't, I don't agree with at this point. Uh, now, however, <laughs> The story is the story gets a little more cloudy because uh, Carol has student Ellison, who sampled a tuff or sampled a sandstone up on Scout Mountain here, and they got three grains with ages six thirty eight ma. And so that, I mean, that's a that's a Marinoan age. So stay tuned, TBA. Okay, so. Um, my preferred interpretation was that there was a long-lived sturdy glacial epoch, ep, glacial epoch, with several non-glacial, uh, non several glaciations. The 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 510 MA, the 680 in Pocatello, the type sturdy at 660, as dated by Grant Cox in South Australia. Um, many strata were deposited by meltwater. It was not a hard snowball. Um, and so the title of the Rooney et al. paper 2015, Two Long Lasting Synchronous Neoprotozoic Glaciations. I don't, that's not what we see. That's not what we see when we look at the rocks. And uh, so um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my opinion. And then, um, and then here is the, the carbon isotope uh, curve. And, and I, I'm not gonna get uh, real far into those. Um, except to say that we've got some Rapitan ages, and then we've got some ages in here, 685, and then we got some up here, 660. So I think there were more than one sturgeon glaciation in different places. And uh, maybe the Rapitan, we could, we can, I don't know much about the Rapitan. I didn't, well, I didn't think the rocks I was looking at were Rapitan. But anyway, <laughs> um, maybe we could do a hard snowball there. I don't think we can do a 60, there's not a 60 million year old glaciation. And no. Okay. And then uh, one of the things which, um, which confused us at the time and still does is this, Laminated shale, the upper Pocatello formation. And this looks like the kind of deposit you would find as a, as a post-glacial transgressive deposit. And so if some of these, uh, the Twitya formation in 
um, North Canada is Twit is Sturdian, and then this one here is is Intrasturdian, or Maranoan. It um, it's a problem. It's a problem, and uh, and more work should should be done. Okay, so just to remind you all, <laughs> the the we've been round and round on this. How many glaciations there were? Uh, I don't buy two synchronous neocrotic or sorry glaciations. I think there's evidence of a Rapitan, Pocatello, Sturdian and Pocatello, not just one Sturdian glaciation. And then I would just add into the mix. Um, Nate Lorenz found these aragonite crystal fans in the carbonate above the upper, above the upper. Uh, uh, above the cap carbonate. And so globally, these fans are only in Maranoan uh, deposits. So the Idahoan Glacier Liberal, the name has been tossed around. I thought it was Frank Corsetti's originally. Carol uh, uh, Daler uh, thinks that she uh, uh, used it. Anyway, maybe maybe there's, there's something to that. Okay, so that's all I've got. And uh, um, I've talked about Idaho and questions. Go ahead, Nick. Hi, Louise. Thanks. All right. So I think a solution um, uh, exists for your um, older than anticipated zircons. And um, I am driven to that position after much kicking and screaming because I don't like this at all. But Lyle, Lyle Nelson has finally convinced me that that in fact, um, in California, there are two glacial intervals, both the early and the late cryogenian, and it's very hard to avoid that. Um, so then as you go northward into Utah and Idaho, you're not very far away and ice sheets are big things. So I, I find it very hard to imagine that if, if Lyle is correct about there being both the early and the late cryogenian glacials present in California, we've got them in Utah and Idaho, it's hard to imagine which means that you're forced into the position that the ash bed you've just been describing has to be um, basically at the, um, the base of the Ediacaran. So then the question is, well, how do you explain the zircon population? And I agree with you, those zircons were probably not rolling around on the surface. So supposing the magma that made the ash, so it is an ash, it's a primary ash, supposing the magma came up through a volcanic edifice and the old volcanic edifice had zircons of that age in it, which were older zircons, and that the actual event, the actual ash that you're dating does not have primary zircons of the age of the ash, but it has zircons that it picked up on its ascent through the crust. So just like it had the Archean zircons in it, it has these 667 zircons, but the 667 is not the age of the ash, it is the age of the zircon. And it simply doesn't have any zircons of the age you want, which is around about uh, 635. So it's not sitting around on the surface, they're not, it's not epiclastic in that sense, is simply inherited grains, and that solves the problem. That solves the riddle of how you then mesh Idaho with California. Yes. Uh, while you were talking, uh, Nick, I, I couldn't help of thinking, but the analogy uh, to a dry heave. Anyway, um, uh, yes, that, that would be interesting to have a, a an eruption that produced no zircons, but produce a lot of old recycled ones, and maybe you could get out of it that way. Um, yes, it's it's uh, it's an issue. the uh, The other thing, which uh, let's see, can I go up? I can't go up. Um, yeah, so there there are these six thirty seven ma zircons, uh, which are found in a in a sandstone above the cap carbonate. And that fits with your, uh, it fits with the idea that it, it would be Maranoan. But um, I guess the, I don't know, the, we would have to, we would have to send yet another graduate student out to look at the Pocatello formation to find the sturdy and Maranoan um, disconformity. <laughs> hey, Paul, can I share my screen? Yeah. Can you give me permission to do that? Uh, you should have that. permission. It's just Paul needs to stop sharing. Okay, stop sharing, Paul. Yeah. Okay, let me see here. 
Okay, can you see a, can you see a strat column? Yep. People? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is figure 25 out of my graduate student Matt Ellison's um, master's thesis that he recently finished. And this is a composite stratigraphic column of the Scallop Mountain member of the Pocatello Formation. Um, and you can see down at the bottom, this is the lower dimictite and up at, near the top in purple is the upper dimictite. Um, coming down to this lower dimictite, there is a very sharp contact here on top of the lower dimictite where it's cut out and overlain by arcosic sandstones. So uh, we interpret this as a significant disconformity. Um, the, the youngest uh, CAID Tim's DZ grains in the upper, lower diamictite are 687. And those are interfingering with uh, these day sites that were recently dated and published that are 695. Okay, so there's an igneous age of 695 here. And then the, the youngest zircons here, the MDA is 687. You cross that on conformity, the youngest grains you find are 657, which are already younger then you're tough that's way up here at the top. Um, the next uh, unit up that we dated, it, the age isn't shown here, but this is the cobble conglomerate. We have a 651 um, CAID Tim's population from here. Um, from the upper dynamic type, we have a 639 MADZ population. And then we have our 637 MA population, which is sandstones kind of interbedded with the, the other cap facies. Um, and I have no problem with aragonite fans. They're just part of the greater um, cap sequence that makes up the Merimnellan sequence. And they're pretty typical of, um, you see them higher up in cap sequences and oftentimes they're limestone uh, replaced aragonite fans. And that's, that's what we have here. Um, so, that suite of ages and the, it, it was very consistent and demands actually that both the Maranoan and the Sturdian are present here. And before we even got this age, if you just, I spent quite a bit of time on this cap Dola stone and its associated facies and went to Namibia with Paul Hoffman and went to Death Valley with um, Ryan Pedersen and um, that's what really sealed the deal for me is the, what they have in common. And now there's how many cap carbonates that are actually dated at, at 635 and these are 637. So that's just an MDA for these. Um, what else? I have one more thing to say. Uh, I, guess, I guess that's it. So I just wanted to share this with you and I apologize that um, this isn't published yet. All right, Paul, did you want Did you have anything you wanted to respond with? Uh, well, no, I mean, I, th that's all, uh, th those are the, the numbers she's gotten and, uh, and Mark Schmitz has gotten actually. And, um, and it's, it's messy. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's ironic that, uh, you find a tough, oh my gosh, what a great deal. And then there's all these problems with it. But <laughs> that's geology. Yeah. So I'm what just is... looking through the chat here. Yeah, yeah. There's some going back and says, forth. Francis says the 667 grades are also below the Marinolan. Um, yeah, yeah we don't... I have nothing to say. I think Carol summed it up nicely and showed what the story is. So QED. There are 667 grains that go all the way down and we find them in the Arcos directly above the lower dimectite. We just don't show them in this particular figure because here we wanted to show our youngest populations of all of our different facies. Yeah, tufts can have xenocrysts that aren't abraded, but aren't the age of eruption. Well, um, that was Nick's point. That was Nick's point. 
so Lyle Nelson came up and walked this section with me after working on the Paradise section down in, Death, in the Panamints. And we saw, he's all sorts of old friends. And by the end of the day, we felt, felt like there was a very strong correlation with the, uh, it may be down to a facies level, like the Kabul conglomerates. You know, they could even be representing um, a similar climate or depositional environment. Um, so they're they're pretty darn similar. They're all different, but um, a lot of the same faces, and it, they, they seem like old friends. Regarding the Rapitan, uh, which began at 717, uh, the cap carbonate was dated by uh, Alan Rooney at around 662. Right. And nowhere have two sturdy and cap carbonates ever been described, and wherever they're dated, they're around 660. Right. Well, and also we never see the base of the Pocatello formation, but there are clasps in the diamictites. Rem remind me, Paul, but there's a, I think there's a 717 <clears throat> basalt within the diamictites suggesting that that lower kind of Rapitan equivalent um, lip age and basaltic facies are probably just at depth. And the, the Pocatello formation has a lot of similarities with the, with the Franklin slash Rapitan. Yeah, they did. See, I don't, I don't know that there are any for sure. Well, I, 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 you know, you got, okay, so the Rapitan 715, 710, all right, so the Pocatello lower, lower one is, is uh, you got these 695, so there's 25 MA. I, you know, it just, um, it's a different time scale. It's a different. Well, it's just that we don't see the whole pokey and there's older volcanic class within the clastic units of the pokey we see. Mm -hmm. And so I, I get this sense that it's probably all there or was there and um, we just only see it as remnant class now. To change the topic, um, in the DNAG volume, I suggested that, that the Belt Purcell was a, a basin like the South Caspian Sea which is a trapped oceanic crust and uh, you know, has 15 to 20 kilometers of sediment um, that was formed in an intercontinental uh, basin, which is shallow at the top and, uh, and also wasn't deformed uh, because it's got very stiff um, oceanic lithosphere underneath it. And the belt also doesn't seem to have been very much deformed before the Cretaceous. So, um, Nobody seems to have uh, taken up that idea, but I wonder what you thought of the idea of the belt per cell um, being trapped with Australia, if you like, uh, as the trapper. Um, so I, you would think that you would find in the hafnium isotopes on sin belt zircons evidence that it, came through oceanic crust rather than through uh, through uh, continental crust, but- not if, the zircons came from, not if the zircons came from outside the basin. Yeah, well. You know, <laughs> the, the Caspian Sea isn't filled with sediment that originated in the Caspian Sea. They originated so, in the Copas Dock and the, and the Transcaucasus Mountains. The, they're all those cells. They're all those lower belt cells and things. And um, and again, we're um, I'm out of my depth here, but but isn't there a way to to decide if they were they were erupted on continental or oceanic crust, or maybe well, they the are? South, the South Caspian Sea began as a back arc basin. Because mm -hmm. then we need an arc. <laughs> All right, looks like Nicholas is ready with another one for you. Um, I'm sorry, I lost some of the discussion there. I lost the Zoom completely. Um, the point, the point, one of the points I made with uh, Luigi um, a couple of days ago was that, of course, you've got two things going on in terms of the glaciation. You've got the timing of the glaciation, which is very interesting because there are there are dates you can say well, these rocks are a certain age. But you've also got the fact that the sediments are accumulating in basins. So what you need is you need to have the glaciation happening, and you need to be able to record it. And that's why when you look at the thicknesses of units. You know, in different places, they're all over the place. I mean, Lyle, Lyle Nelson's 
thicknesses through the Death Valley area, they, they vary greatly between what Luigi is calling Marino and Sturtian. I mean, it's like, because it matters what's subsiding. So you have a record, which is not just the glaciation, it's the record of the basins and they have to work together. So therefore you don't expect to get the full extent of a glacial everywhere because it depends on what's subsiding, depends on where you're standing. And that slides into the, uh, uh, okay, well, Rodinia broke apart and, and long ago Bond et al uh, figured, okay, well, we'll start the, we'll start the rapid subsidence at 600. And so where are these rocks that we're talking about fitting in? And, uh, and, and what happens with the, this is, goes back to that two rift notion, but the, the Rodinia breaking apart at 750, but you don't see any evidence of that in, in, uh, in Idaho. But it, it, yeah, it's, certainly it's, the base nests of a whole. It's a spatial variability, not a temporal variability. So you're saying that if you have rift basins, it's not everywhere that you have the rift. You have to be in the rift basin. So you can be outside the rift basin, but the rifting is still taking place somewhere. And um, so that's, that's and bearing in mind, you only have a small part of your whole, you know, protozoic record preserved actually in our crop. You've got little pieces, bits and pieces. You don't, you don't have a complete record. That's the problem. With regard to the, the to Gerard Bond, of course, now that the Cambrian timescale is being scrunched, of course, if you, if you follow that line of reasoning through, of course, you move the, the time, you remove Gerard's T0 way into the Cambrian now. I mean, it's like, it has to be, it has to be way into the lower Cambrian. Exactly where it is, it's, it's a very um, wide note, it's an approximation. It certainly isn't 600. You've got to be in the Cambrian by this point with the, with the, with the more rapid subsidence. And um, I mean, I like, I like the age of the 60 mile formation. I'm hoping to go and see it in a month or so. <laughs> the 60 mile formation, if that's rifting and it's got 509 zircons in it, then that's it. You know, you've got the, the rifting that goes on into the through through the early Cambrian. Um, and then the, the passive the Gerard's passive margin then becomes a middle Cambrian passive margin. Yeah, I agree with Gerard. I mean, you need a rifting and around the base of the Cambrian to explain the Cambrian division passive margin. You can't do that with a passive with rifting at 750. No, Bond and comments are right on. All right, we've had a pretty open discussion set up here for a bit now, but um, so I'm just going to see if it wants to continue. Anybody can open up for discussion. Mark this on your calendar. Nick and I are in agreement. <laughs> All right, well, that's a good note then. <laughs> Um, well, th thank you, thank you, Paul. This was a, a great um, presentation. Um, definitely some stuff to chew on, things to think about. Um, so with that, everybody go on and have a good rest of your week. I'll send out the notification for next week's um, presentation uh, tomorrow and uh, we'll see you all next Thursday. Welcome to retirement, Paul. Thanks, sir. Bye, Paul. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Carol.